And we are live here in the Storycraft Cafe. I am your host, Hank Garner, and joining me as usual, Josh Hayes, Rick Partlow, Steve Bowyer popped on a minute ago and then popped right back off. Hopefully he'll be um, back with us in a moment. You know, um, I went ahead and preemptively rebooted my internet router a minute ago, so hopefully we, we don't have a repeat of what happened last week where my internet died right at the end and then nobody could. That was super it. fun. That was super fun. Yeah. So hopefully we don't have that happen again. But anyway, we are um, we are here to chat uh, again about writing and rewriting. And um, today I, I, I did an interview a few days ago uh, with Don Winslow and he was talking about this trilogy that he's um, right in the middle of. And I meant to pull it up before I started. He has a um, city on fire was the first book. And then his new book city of dreams came out. And then there's a third, and this is a grand sweeping epic uh, kind of, you know, like the Godfather in, in modern times, if you want to kind of look at it that way. And we had an interesting conversation about uh, trilogies in particular, but this idea of writing in a series. And then, uh, you know, in, when you're writing a book, you have the um, the structure of the book where you have the the introduction to the characters and the story, and you have some sort of uh you know, thing that happens that then sets your characters on, you know, a journey, a quest, whatever. And then, you know, at the end of it is this conclusion and, you know, the, the, uh, the big high point and then resolution. But in the middle, a lot of people get lost in what we like to call the murky middle. And, you know, that, that structure, that very loose structure I'm talking about happens in every book. But then if you're planning a trilogy, then you need to have, kind of an, an, an epic, uh, a, a large scale, um, you know, rise and fall of action. And then also the smaller scale rise, fall, you know, action in that. Um, so one thing I, I wanted to kind of pick your guys' brains about today, and, and one thing uh, Don and I talked about was that if if you're writing that middle book, and we, we talked a lot about the middle book, um, if you can if you can do away with what's in the middle then should you have written a trilogy to begin with um you know could you have just extended the first book a little extended the last book and then kind of tell people what happened in the intervening time what do you guys what do you guys think about the the structure the grand structure of a trilogy and then reducing that down to the smaller structure of a book well, I mean, a trilogy, you should have the same three-act structure as you do in the book itself. So the middle book should be kind of like, you know, the Empire Strikes Back deal where things don't look good. There's a minor victory at the end, but the main battle is still to come, you know, and right. they, they've got a lot of things they have to do in the next book to pull things together. So I think it's necessary to have a third book and unless you're planning a, a, a two book series from the beginning. Um, I think what I've wound up doing in series is if, if I have a bunch of cool stuff in the first book and a bunch of cool stuff in the third book and I'm plotting that I know is going to be in the third book and then I'm plotting the second and I start to write it and I'm like, this is not that interesting. I'll just pull a bunch of the cool stuff from the third book into the second book and take my chances making up stuff of the third book. You know, because you can always come up with something else. Yeah, I um I think it was I think it was Brandon <laughs> Sanderson in one of his lectures that he said uh if you have three cool ideas, don't use uh don't write a book on every one of those ideas put every single one of those ideas into one book. Um, and so I think like with a trilogy specifically, if you're, if you've only got three cool ideas, you can just put those into one book and write one book and see where it goes. But if you're, if you're planning a trilogy, like Rick said, sometimes 
sometimes the second book can feel a bit uh, a little transitional uh, because you're trying to get to that epic ending in the third book. My take on it is um, look at Empire Strikes Back. Like that's the second in what I consider canon Star Wars and the only Star Wars except for Rogue One and a couple other things. But if you look at that chapter and you, there's no one that will say Empire is the weakest. And it, also, it, also Josh, not just the the original three, the original three as they were released in the theaters, not the. <laughs> yes, yes, not yeah. not not the you one with the silly looking. Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Um, but uh, I, you know, you you look at that movie and they do so many things in that movie that make it great. And for for the longest time, Empire was my favorite. <laughs> um, Rogue One's my favorite now, but um, before prior to Empire was my favorite. And and some some people actually say that Jedi is the weaker of the three um, because well, we all know the weakest of the three. Yeah, I mean, I think there's people that do consider it uh, to be a good capstone to the trilogy, but as a as a chapter, as a book, it's it's probably the weakest of the three. But so what I do when I look at writing a trilogy is I set everything up in the first book, and then I try to I try to make the first book as cool as possible. But then I take the second book and like purposely forget about the third book and do everything I can to make the second book uh, better than the first one and to rise, raise the stakes more. And then it, it's kind of like a, the Mark Graney school of writing where you're, you, you can make it bad for your character but if you can do one bad thing why not do five bad things and just like completely screw them up and and if you're gonna if you're gonna let them fight in a train with nowhere to go let them fight in a train with nowhere to go and nobody can see and like just stack on like just layers and layers of heartache for your character and that's what i try to do in my second books because not only the first book, like you're, you're finding out the characters, you're figuring out the story, the mystery or whatever. Um, but you're not going to have those answers in the first book. I like to give those answers in the second book. And then the third book is, uh, the, re it, the whole thing is basically a resolution because now, you know, what's going on in the second book. You, a lot of people try to prolong the mystery of whatever it is until the third book. And you're like, just pulling your readers along and, you know, just kind of feeding them things. But, uh, I, I just recently watched the, the night agent on Netflix and it's a 10 episode series. And by the time you get to episode four, and five, you know everything that's going on. And there are still some twists that happen in six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, that kind of affects the story, but you know generally what's going on by episode five. And then the rest of the show is trying to figure out how we're going to correct it. And I think sometimes you look at uh, a a trilogy and you're like, I'm not going to give any answers to the third book. Well, then you spend half of the book giving the answers. And now you have a finite space of uh, time and, and writing to give a significant resolution. And you, I think me personally, a lot of authors will tie in a final conflict and a resolution in like two chapters and call it square because they were so concerned about the mystery and the conspiracy or whatever it is. They didn't spend enough time painting out the, the full thing that they can do for like, if you read uh, Sanderson's endings to his books, a lot of his endings are the length of some people's novels. <laughs> right like you have a an ending that's like 60,000 words as a sequence and I think a lot of people sell them so short they spend so much time thinking about the problem that by the time they get to write the solution it's like oh they figured it out and they're done well like, oh, make the solution cool like that's part of the whole thing if you can't make the solution cool what's the point sorry I went on kind of a long ramble there I'm, I'm, I'm bike all like blah, 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 today I'm sorry <laughs> But it's good you're not as uh, animated as usual. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Josh. Can you guys think of a good example 
of a trilogy where the second book or second movie is not needed, where it's it's just filler or, you know, it's where if you removed it, you would be, you know, perfectly fine. And and in a way, I guess a, a Highlander good, too. <laughs> a, a good trilogy, maybe you can remove the middle and sandwich the beginning and the end together. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, you know, I was. I was. Thinking, that's kind of a difficult question because, like, what kind of trilogy are you writing? Like Indiana Jones is a trilogy, but it's not really a trilogy, right? It's just right. a collection of three movies. movies. Well, no, I'm talking about the original. I don't think about the the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull as a fluke. But yeah, you're uh, right. Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom could have been pulled out, and nobody would for have sure. Died. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm trying to think. I. I'm trying to think of like any specific trilogies well, that I've. If you take Lord of the Rings. If yeah. you remove the two towers, does does that the whole story still work? No, not really, because a lot of important stuff happens in the two towers. Right. Where where do where do the writers of Rohan come from if you don't have the two towers? For sure. True. Um, and and the Battle of Helm's Deep. Uh There's a and then you've got all of the. Uh, the the undead that uh, that Aragorn makes the pact with. Yep. Is that in, was that that in I think that, that's in the third one. I think <laughs> that's in the beginning of the. Third I, I get. I, I've never read. I've read the first book, but I haven't read the second. I two. read all three of them. Uh, the first book is really the best one. I mean, I, I mean, I, they're all supposed to be one book, but what it comes down to is the first book is really really good. Uh, the second one is badly. <sighs> put together because he you know how in the movie where they go back and forth between the hobbit you know uh frodo and sam trying to get the ring to mordor and and the the uh the whole rohan thing you know the battle of helm's deep they go back and forth well in the book tolkien puts all of home helm's deep in one section of the book and right. then all of the hobbits in another section of the book so by you know reading the the section with the hobbits was like it was just so grueling i mean maybe he wanted to show you how grueling it was for them but it was grueling reading it <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the third book was really really I'm short down, chris <laughs> the third book was really short and most of it was appendices it was a lot of appendices i, I think people kind hey, of it's steve uh, and his beard <laughs> I think Steve's beard is named Jamie Castle. That's where he gets that. That's what it is. <laughs> and no contacts today. So I haven't put him Christine, in yet. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Um, we are right now. We're discussing <laughs> um, trilogies and knowing whether your story idea can uh, stand up to trilogy treatment. Uh, when can a story be? Uh, extended out that far when are certain chapters and by chapters I mean books in the trilogy when are those not needed and we've been talking about trilogies that worked and each of its each of their component pieces work on their own but also to hold up the larger story and uh, the, the, the question I just asked the guys was is there a trilogy either books movies whatever that the second uh, edition is not needed can you think of any? Um, well, you know, I have uh, I have the publisher response and I have the author response, which are, are quite and, different. Um, and that's things. why we invite you to get. Yeah, right. I mean, um, <laughs> while I'm thinking about ones that worked or didn't work, the publisher response is unfortunately single books don't sell. So if you don't have a trilogy or more. Um, is that a genre specific answer? Uh, I mean, uh, yes and no. Right. Okay. okay. If we if we want to take. <clears throat> I would say maybe a thriller could sell. But again, you're talking about you, you've got to have a name in that industry for somebody to care who you are enough to pick up your random new book. Um, One person comes to mind. Peter Swanson is a, a great thriller author that uh, has published about 12 thrillers. And he has a big kind of blockbuster release each year, and they're all standalones. Yeah. And I have no idea why I just grabbed Pete, but that that's just came to mind. 
there's a, you know, trad pub specifically, you can, you can get away with a lot of those um, one-offs as long as basically they're all the same story. Um, because even though they don't call them series, oftentimes in the thriller market, you're, you're reading what feels like a series with different names and, and different locations. But uh, you know, you think about romance, romance does series thrillers really still do series sci-fi fantasy have to do series um, mysteries series um, in the trad pub market where things are put on bookshelves and there's author name recognition and things of that nature uh, and a lot of money to go behind it. That's a different story. But when you're talking about selling digitally ebook series are really still king. Um, but you get the oddball, right? I have several oddballs, but yeah, go ahead. Why, why is that, Steve? Why, why do series sell and standalones don't? Is, is that I mean, are, are we as readers? I mean, let's put our reader hat on for a minute. Are we conditioned to think of stories in this grander, more epic scope? Um, do do trilogies hold, or you know, or series hold some intrinsic? value that standalones don't what why do they sell and standalones don't i'd say there's a metaphysical answer here okay. i don't know if that's even the right term but like we live in a netflix society we live yeah. in a we live in a movie society where series are are a big deal mm -hmm. um we live in a in a world where robert jordan tolkien R.A. Salvatore, sort of the guys who were founding these genres, um, if I could speak sci-fi fantasy specifically, like they set a tone for what to expect from fantasies, um, whether it be Forgotten Realms or Dragonlance or any of those things, like people got invested in a world and they wanted to live in that world. Now, just from the sake of our minds, fantasy and sci-fi, like we want to live in a specific world. Star Trek will live in that world forever. Um, uh, Harry Potter, apparently we're going to live in that world forever. They're doing a TV show now based on every the last 10 years. Yeah. Every season is, is a book. Is anybody excited about that? By the way, I'm stoked. I can't wait. Um, I think it's going to be a challenge that they're going to be replacing the main cast, but at the end of the day, if they do it right and they, you know, and, and I'm happy about it. Um, thrillers, we've got Jack Ryan, we've got Mission Impossible, we've got James Bond that's been around since 1940 something, 50 something. Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher. Um, we've well, and, I, and also you have to look at those series as like those series have. Uh, you mentioned Mission Impossible, like Mission Impossible 2, you can completely almost write that off. Uh, the first one was specifically supposed to be a standalone, and it was a great movie in and of itself. And then starting at 3, 4, 5, and 6, they have the same characters and uh, some like through plot between them, but they have to deal with an individual problem in each movie. Right. And But um, they're it's the it's the setting specifically and the characters that people want to see right they want to see uh hunt do crazy things they want to see ving i can't remember ving rhymes character but they want to see him do crazy things and they want to come back and experience those things and see what they can do um and i think sometimes in in series and trilogies that's it like people like steve said they want to live in that universe they want to be with those characters and see what they're going to do for another situation and there's something to be said about not having to relearn a story right yeah right you could jump in on dresden and if you've read any of those you're like i know who this guy is nobody needs to tell me anything now cool let's get to the story for sure but talking about series from the perspective of something other than books right we just saw this with um netflix where ryan johnson did um the knives out and glass onion films mm -hmm. and he adamantly didn't want the name uh knives out attached to glass onion he wanted knives out to be a thing he wanted glass onion to be a thing and netflix said nope it's going to be called glass or it's going to be called knives out glass onion because we need the name recognition of the franchise to make sure people know that they're related mm -hmm. and the, the only not, thing tying those franchises together is daniel craig Daniel Craig, and they could have called it um, uh, whatever his name was. I can't remember his name, but they could have I called can't it either. But uh, and, and, uh, blank mystery. 
Yeah, and and that's how um, a gay Cajun uh, mystery necessary that as a as a series is because we don't remember his character's name. We don't we don't care about his backstory. He was he was the detective that you know we we didn't get enough. The the story's not about him. It's about the mystery. It's Sherlock Holmes part two without any of the involvement of Sherlock Holmes, like right. idiosyncrasies and, and all of those things. And um, but it's it's I, I only bring that up to sort of prove a point that we're not just talking about the book world that considers franchises valuable. We yeah. wouldn't be getting remakes of Robocop. We wouldn't be getting remakes of what was the other one they announced at the same time as Robocop. Um are they doing another remake of RoboCop? Yeah, or are you talking about reviving, the one that? No, they're reviving RoboCop and they're reviving TV another. Show. It's gonna be on Amazon Prime TV show, right? Yep. Really? Because I just I, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't even know that they had redone RoboCop the movie with. Well, uh, yeah, I can't remember the dude. I thought it was okay. It wasn't great. Ten years ago, ago, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the Amazon bought out uh, MGM no and they got all the properties, so they're. Mining that the, the properties for IP they can, you know. I mean, Ghostbusters, the the sort of like re, rehashes, they couldn't be really further from Ghostbusters. They, they right. were just sort of there and had the Ghostbusters tag, and, and everybody wanted to be a part of it. I liked Ghostbusters Afterlife. I thought Afterlife was fantastic. Um, the, did it need to be Ghostbusters? Things, to be a good uh, film? No. Ghostbusters mascot. What's that? The Stranger Things Ghostbusters mashup. Yeah, I mean that's really what it was. Um, yeah. And so, are there movies and shows that I think could have done without like a second film? Um, I think there's several series that we've watched go by that. I mean, Fast and the Furious probably needed one movie ever. <laughs> Jaws needed one movie. Jaws needed one movie. That's I mean, Jaws like. Jurassic Park sort of would have benefited from only one movie if it wasn't for the financial gain right. associated with. Well, yeah, I mean, thematic, I mean, as far as the the entertainment value, it only needed one, but financially, it made so much money. There was just in it, and it's still every single one of those movies has made a billion dollars. And that speaks to us as writers. Sometimes we have an idea that's like, this is the perfect novel. I would love to just tell this story and make money. But that's impossible sometimes when, I don't know. I, I mean, there's so many facets that go into it, but like Rick well, Hartlow's Drop Trooper, why would he stop writing it? People love the world. People want to live in the world and it makes money. I don't know why anybody want to live in that world. It's really dangerous. It's super dangerous. It's a lot. <laughs> How Cam is still alive? Uh, only, only by Rick's hand. I actually, uh, you know, I, I, I go into that in one of the books, uh, I have him joking around with another Marine saying, you know, there's a theory that uh, we live in an infinite number of universes and that the only the one you're in are you're the, you're the one observing it. So you're the only one that can't die, but to everybody else you've died like a million times, but to you, everybody else is dying and you're still alive. <laughs> I mean, it goes back to that question of like, uh, why why is Cam Alvarez invincible? Um, because there wouldn't be a story to write about if he did. There's a um, there's a trilogy of books. Peter F. Hamilton writes like really long space, like sweeping space opera, right? And yeah. um, I think two of his best books are Pandora Star and Judas Unchained. But really, the the trilogy that really really set him apart. Night's the uh, uh, was Night's Dawn, The Reality Dysfunction. And I remember reading that first book and just being absolutely blown away by the, the sweeping aspect of the story. Didn't and they make it six books in the U.S.? And it was a they, they, it, they did make it six books in the U.S. because they're, they're really long books. They're like this um, long. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're beefy. Um, but I remember reading through the second book going, there's too much here. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the trilogy itself is like a million words. It's super long, just as three books. Um, but I think in terms of looking at what you need and what you don't need in a trilogy, you have to consider what are you writing it for? Like, are you writing it for the story? Or are you writing it for the characters? And are the readers reading it for the story? Or are they reading it for the characters? Because the second book in the Night's Dawn trilogy, I mean, they're hugely character-focused, all three of them. 
Uh, but you learn so much about the character, the setting, all of that stuff through the second book that the impact of what happens in the third book might not have been as high had he not had the second book, even though the second book was kind of dragging through. Um, that's one of the things I look at when when writing tri trilogies or series is the ending going to be impactful with all of this other stuff and how can you make it more impactful? I mean, I just watched the, the last episode of Picard season three. I'm not going to spoil it um, because it just came out today, but being a TNG fan from the time I could watch TV from like when I was like 10 to now almost 42, I've, seen almost every single episode and there are a lot of episodes in star trek that you don't need to watch <laughs> there's a lot of them that are like oh just throw all these out in the trash but the end of this picard season three because i had experienced all of that before the end of this was so emotionally impactful that i just sat and like was just in awe because it was such a great ending I'm I'm glad you brought up Picard because uh and we'll take a sidebar for just a second, but I have not watched any Picard, yeah. none of any of the seasons because uh I had no hopes for it. And then after the, the reviews I was hearing when it first came out, everybody said it was trash and I just didn't waste my time. Now I'm hearing everybody say that season three is amazing. What did they do? that made season three so much better. And that's a super you, easy question. It's why a super... would you waste your time on seasons one and two? First of all, don't watch seasons one and two. You don't need to. Okay. They're, they're, they're nowhere connected with season three. You can just skip all of that. You don't okay, need it. So, so I disagree. As I just the writers of the series or the showrunner. Stop. I disagree entirely. You told me that and you're wrong. You're talking from the perspective of somebody who's seen all of them. And you're wrong. If I didn't watch seasons one and two, I would not have given a flying. Crap. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm talking about Picard, not Star Trek. You told me TNG, though, the same thing. Everyone kept telling me the exact same thing about TNG. No, no, no. I, one and two. Well, no, I said that I thought the series really took off in season three. Like you can watch the first Picard specifically. Yeah, no, Picard specifically. Skip Picard one and Picard two. That those seasons because they they are the writing is trash. They really they treat the Federation and Picard and some of those characters with with no respect whatsoever. Um, and and they they completely trash everything that Star Trek at its core was. Uh, TNG all the seasons are great. Um, like season one is kind of weak. Season two kind of gets better. I think in season three, it really takes off, but it definitely watch them all. Characters. Yeah. 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 But in Picard season three, the reason it is so much better than one and two is because not only did they focus on really engaging the TNG characters, because that's who people wanted to see. They, they brought a lot of things from, TNG into Picard. A lot of um, Easter eggs, a lot of like nostalgic fan service type things, but it wasn't fan service just to be fan service. It was fan service on a character emotional level where those characters were resonating with something and that made it impactful for the audience who'd watched TNG for years. And, and then we get to see the growth of the TNG characters from where they were at the end of season seven to now and Picard season three is pretty much TNG season eight. Okay. And it really takes okay. the core of the original cast, brings them together, changes some things. There's some other things going on. There's a lot of like interpersonal drama that happen. There's a lot of growth that happens. Um, and uh, there are th there are things in Picard season three that like hit me right here because I had watched TNG for years. Okay, let me let me ask you this then, and and this is completely hypothetical because we can't separate the Picard from the history of Star Trek and yeah, and TNG and all and and th there's no way to do that. So this is this is just an academic question. Sure, um, but. 
if if there was no existing Star Trek, in and and Picard was a brand new thing, yeah, would Picard season one and two have mattered to anyone? And for that matter, would season three have mattered to anyone? Because there's not all of this um, built-in emotional. I don't want to say baggage. That's the wrong word. But you bring all of that with you to Picard season three. Well, if sure. you didn't have all that to bring with you, could it stand? And I'm, I apologize. I think I, no, no, you're I, fine. I I, I I can see what you're saying. I think as a story, yes, Picard season three could stand without the rest of it. It probably would not have the same emotional resonance as it has. Um, it wouldn't have the same nostalgic resonance that it has because a lot of the things that happen or that are shown in the series are really impactful because they pull directly from TNG and, and use some of that stuff in the series. I think the story as a whole could be good on its own. Um, but the series as a whole is really, you couldn't have as a fundamental story. You could not have Picard season three without star Trek because, because the story itself wouldn't, it could not happen without TNG. And I'll, I'll say that because there are a lot of things that TNG did that... No, no, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it. But there are a lot of things that happened in TNG that make Picard Season 3 possible. Okay, by that same measure, yeah. would Season 1 and 2 have been better for you if you didn't have all of the TNG that you brought with you to that? I think po- yes. Possibly, yeah. Um, I mean, if they hadn't made Picard the main character and it would have just been a story in and of itself, I think it would have probably been a good story. But when you take when you take the 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 key character of the whole thing and you fundamentally change him and how people react to him. Um, I mean, there's a, a scene in, in season one where she, this admiral is like cursing at Picard. And I'm like, well, first of all, okay, I get it. Like, you, you could do whatever you want because it's not regular TV. You can curse or do any of that. But that's not Starfleet. Right. That's not Star Trek. Like, that at its core, that's not. And she's talking to Picard. Like, how many times has he put his self on the line for everything. And now it, all of that is basically just wiped away. I don't know. I, I possibly the answer to your I question. It, it could have been be better. Not, it would have to be not star Trek altogether. 100%. I think a lot of the things that people are doing now with like reboots or like whatever else, I think they would be really good shows if they weren't attached to a, a franchise like, uh, like Jack Ryan. I think the the, the Jack Ryan series would have been a fantastic show in and of itself had it not been keyed to Tom Clancy and Jack Ryan because it's not Jack Ryan, like yeah. as Tom Clancy presented him, right? As Tom Clancy presented him, as well, it's true. 45 it's... other authors that were not named Tom Clancy. Well, Tom that, that's true, but I... at one time did write Jack Ryan. So, how about Back to the Future 2? Back, oh. Back to the Future too. I think you yeah. could get rid of two and three. I've been you can just throw them out; they don't matter. Yeah. Yes, don't matter. The only reason I like Back to the Future too is because the hoverboards. I, I like that sec. Uh, okay, th- can that I throw out a really it. weird one? Yeah. Mean Girls two. Never. I have no idea. I remember Mean Girls one. Right, Mean Girls one. This is my guilty pleasure. If it's on, <laughs> I don't if being it's mean on I'm watching it. <laughs> really, hilarious movie. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Uh, S- Lion King 2. Never never knew it existed. Right? It, <laughs> precisely. The Return Aladdin of Jafar King. was pretty good. Return, I was just about to say, Return of Jafar, Aladdin 2, did we need that? It was uh, all I, right. I, my kids watched that. I, I watched that with my kids when they were little. And actually, 2 wasn't... 3 sucked, but 2 wasn't yeah. that Did um, you know there was a Zoolander 2? No way. Yeah, yeah. Like these are some of the sequels that are just like you know that it's, money it's, we're talking about books in here mostly. Getting back to a book sequel, <laughs> um, it's all I story. Think that, I think in trad publishing, particularly uh, before the last ten years or so, that a lot of book sequels came out years and years after the first one, and most of them 
we're not needed and we're nowhere near as good as the first one. Um, I have one particular example in mind. One of my favorite books of all time is called Ariel. It's by Stephen Boyette. And it's a, um, it's a fantasy where uh, technology stops working and magic starts working and a whole bunch of magical creatures appear on earth. Um, and it's the story of this, this young teenager who finds a unicorn. And what the heck? Am I, <laughs> Am I here still? Sorry. There <laughs> we go. There we go. Uh, and it was a great book. It was a coming of age story that came out around the time I was turning 18. And it was a really excellent story, really moving and gut wrenching in places. And then something like 25 years later, Boyette wrote a sequel to that book. Um, totally unneeded, totally character-wise undid so much of what the first book did. And he tried to bring the technology of the world that we lost into the 2000s. And it was a total mess. It should never have been written. The main character sucked. And I'm like, why did why did he, I know why people thought they wanted a sequel because it was a very beloved novel, but what possessed the author to turn something that was triumphant in the end and was really spoke to a lot of people, especially younger people, because it it showed them, you know, um, it sh it showed this kid who was just turning like eighteen really having to become an adult and deal with the world. And then the, the next book, it's like bitter and cynical and depressing. And I, I don't- the answer has to be money, right? The answer has to yeah. be money was the factor that mm -hmm. Ender's Game was the same way to me, right? Like Orson Scott Card did not need to write- Speaker of the Dead, holy crap. Of the Dead. <laughs> yeah. Ender's Game was so- like you were talking about Rick, so triumphant feeling and like, great. And then speaker for the dead was Blech. just depressing. And then it continued, the series continued to go on. And um, I don't know. I, I think, think when you're, the answer. I think if you're planning a trilogy and you're, you're, and I, I know that the title of this episode is finishing up your book and preparing for your follow-up work. But I, I think if you're planning a trilogy, um, and you're just writing to the end, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice because there's so many things that layer wise that you can use a second book for. Um, because if you're just tack, if the second book is spent just tackling things from the first book, um, it, it could get really boring really quickly. It, you have to introduce more things other than the ending. Um, and that's what I use the second books for when I'm like right now I'm, I'm writing the second book in my weaponized trilogy and we'll see if it goes farther than three, but, uh, I'm really trying to ramp the stakes up, uh, in a way that will still make the third book interesting and like have a great climactic finale. But at the same time, you want to do that in every single one of your books. And what, what I found, one of the things I found from Rick, Richard Fox when we were planning our follow-up books, and if you read his Ember War series, he did this really well, is he wrote one idea, capped that idea, and then pretty much set up a little, not a cliffhanger, but a, okay, this is what we're going to go do next. And... Um, so you can see that kind of jump between books and you're like, okay, we're going to be dealing with a completely new thing here. Even though the Ember War spans nine books, they're dealing with one thing per book and he doesn't, the, sorry, go ahead. no, no, I go ahead. I think that's a great point to, to touch on our actual subject in indie fan in indie, uh, uh, books a lot. What I think people tend to think they need to do is stop a story almost midway, right? That cliffhanger thing, um, television show style, where at the end of every television show, you feel like you need to read the next one. 
But what I find most most fulfilling is when the entire arc finishes in a in a book and then there's enough for us to go, oh, I want to know what happens in this next thing they're setting up. There's always that we're going on a next mission thing that I think for me at least makes me want to read it. Dresden finishes them all up. Mm -hmm. A couple of new examples that I could point to. Has anyone read um, The Gray Bastards by Jonathan French? Yes. I started it. That book was phenomenal. Yep. And then True Bastards lost me entirely. First of all, he switched main characters. That's the one with... Uh... Do do right? I, I liked... The character that I followed, and it's first person, I believe, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken. So we got this cool story from the perspective of one dude, and then it switched to this chick, this woman, that I didn't necessarily. She was in book one, but like, I signed on for a story about this guy. And yeah, um, I, there's a, there, an author I really like. I really love his books, but he did that too, and it it kind of like soured me with. Larry Korea and his Monster Hunter International series. I'm all in that for Owen and Julie and the main characters. And then he had like two or three books where the main focus of the book is some side character. And yeah. some people love this, you know, but I'm like, I, I'm here wanting to read about Owen and Julie. You know, I, I these guys are interesting and maybe you can have like a, a side thing that's not in the main not in the main continuity, I mean, not in the main series or short story anthology, but taking one of the main books and taking the main characters that I started reading, like the first three or four books to read and pushing them off way to the side and making somebody else the main character of one of the main books in your series, that kind of lost me. I, I haven't really gone back to it after that. I think that's the challenge, right? Is that oftentimes authors do things like this thinking that their series is, and I'm not talking about Larry specifically, because I actually haven't read most of those. I've read a couple of them, but like authors get to a point often where they're like, any people are going to buy anything that I write or anything that I write under this series. And then what ends up happening is a lot of people, this happened with commune by Joshua Gayu. Um, mm -hmm. We put out book five in a series and it didn't quite follow the same characters. And man, it's evident people were disinterested. Um, many of the comments were just, where are my characters? Where is Gibbs? Where, you know, and, um, you know, Joshua wanted to write this and I'm fine with that, but that's the, that's the risk you take, uh, when you do something of that nature. I think one of the things you can look at when you do a, a sequel as well, like a second bridge book is, is not everything you have to do to your characters has to affect the big plot of your trilogy like you can do uh you can affect you can throw things at them that have nothing to do with the main plot and have them work to overcome those things so they they can get back to the main plot as long as you're not throwing them down too many rabbit trails but there's so many things that you can do to ramp it up i mean for instance uh in the gunslinger uh in the second book the dude gets his fingers bit off and that changes everything about that character that we really loved in the second book because he's such a you know there's so many parts where he's his fingers are doing the work and he's reloading and he's firing and there's all that well he gets his fingers bit off and he can't do that and we're and but that builds a certain level of conflict and tension that you didn't have prior and it makes him have to overcome that stuff to press forward so there's a lot i'm not saying you have to cut characters arms off or do drastic things Brett and like I that blinded but, a guy in yeah. book three of our series and then we had to write three more books so the guy's blind it's <laughs> <laughs> hard yeah there's a, series, there's a series by stephen lawhead uh the song of albion and um, there are there there's one main protagonist across all three books, but at the in in the first book is first person from this character's perspective. In the second book, it is first person, but from another character's perspective. But it's still about the main protagonist from book one. the The whole trilogy is about him, and you're following him. But in book two. It's first person in a third person kind of way because mm -hmm. the, the story's still about this other guy, 
but you're seeing him through this other character's And eyes. how did you feel about that? I loved it. At, at first, at first, it was a little jarring because I felt like, and, and I was reading this 25 years ago as it was coming out. And at first I was like, well, I, I, I got attached to this character. I want to continue on with him. But I quickly realized that I was still getting this other guy's story, but I was getting it with nuance about the world uh, because the second book was from like a Druid's perspective and the, the Druid that was there, their, uh, that was in their tribe. And so you were getting a different perspective of the tribe and of your main protagonist, but from this other perspective. And it, it just, when I realized what he was doing, it, it blew my mind because I was, I realized that I was getting a, a much deeper perspective of the story than I would have gotten if he would have just stuck with first person narrative from the protagonist's point of view. There's so a, it was, it was gutsy. Uh, I'll give him that, but I loved it. There's a challenge that we face today that a lot of authors really never have. And that is the audiobook industry. Yeah. Um, French, uh, uh, Jonathan French was a great example. The gray bastards was in, it was in a male perspective, therefore read by a male. I'm a listener. Second book, I, ha I got a new narrator. Not only did I get a new main character, I got a new narrator. And like sometimes when you listen to books, you're listening to it for the narrator. I go back to to Drop Trooper a lot because Rick Scott Cam Alvarez voiced by James Patrick Cronin. I love James Patrick Cronin. If on book six, Rick gave us a different perspective and it had to be a different narrator. I might fall off because I just don't want to listen to another narrator for 10 hours. Right. Um, a, a, a good example of what we were talking about with um, stopping a, stopping a story sort of midway and then going, okay, now here's book two. And it's really just a continuation of the story. A great example of somebody who did not do that was uh, Peter McLean in priest of bones uh, to my mind to my mind right like he's got uh I that was a great this, story by the way I, I pointed this out to josh um there's almost two parts of the story and i called him and i said so this book just basically ended at 50 percent and then went on and it was almost impressive to me because like the big arc <laughs> ended and then a new arc sort of began and i felt like i got my money's worth out of that story um i don't mean to say that in you know like we all get upset when somebody's like you can't pay 4.99 for a book i don't mean it like that but he could have stopped and made the next one book too but in traditional fantasy you don't do that you you give them the full story and then there's the next book in the series <clears throat> right uh, and I was, I loved it. And I think that's a, a testament to his writing ability and something that we as authors should strive for just because your arc's done. Does that mean the book's done? Or is there something else? <clears throat> I think a lot of, a, a lot of people in, in, in the indie space are, are really hung up on the cliffhangers, like really wanting to make that, uh, you know, Oh my God, movie. what happens to the characters now? We have to keep reading. But uh, I, I agree with Steve. I like having that closure on the end of a, uh, on a I sequence, mean, uh, on a book. It, they did that because it worked. I mean, at least it used to work. It brought people back. But as a reader, I hate it. And yeah. while some people will hang in there and come back, I I have been known to just stop reading series on things like that. I think a lot of people do, Rick. Um, my Dragon Blood Assassin series, we've got some cliffhangers. Yeah, we tie things up. But man, do we have some some cliffhangers that if if it was just me writing it, I don't know that I would have done, um, but Andy and I writing together decided that we're going to do this. They're long books. We're 200,000 words into it. And we're like, hey, we got to stop. We have to stop. And this is a very like epic stopping point to bring the next one in. But like Black Badge, Cold as Hell, is a, it's a sort of standalone. Yep. And then the epilogue makes you go, crap, now I have to read the next one. For sure. Yeah. Well, and I think that I think that that's different than a cliffhanger. I think that with especially with like cold as hell, um, that is a setup. It's not more. It's it's not because the the main point of cold as hell is finished. It's wrapped up. We've got a satisfying 
conclusion to that particular story. And then we just set up something else. And it's not that we're missing anything from book one because that's done and finished. Now we get to experience something completely different and we get a little bit of a taste of maybe what's coming in the, in the next book. And, and, and I think that that little bit of a taste is better than a cliffhanger because then we're not like, Oh my God, what happened now we're anticipating. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is going to be really good because of and other it's funny. Cause this goes back to a subject matter that we discussed last week, which was, um, it doesn't matter what we as authors call things. It matters what readers call things. I can't remember the subject that we were talking about. Right, right, right. Uh, I just can't remember. Um, but cliffhanger is one of those things that I think readers just tag on to. Oh, plot holes. We were talking about plot holes. Yeah. So oh, yeah. there's the, we got plot armor. We got plot holes. We got all these things. And we separate all of these. But readers just go, it's a plot hole. And with cliffhangers so many reviews on cold as hell they were happy about it but they were like oh that cliffhanger and that's not it wasn't a cliffhanger you right. don't have to read the next book to know what happened at the end of cold as hell right we just we we set up a new thing for you to jump into and if you don't want to that's cool but if you want to find out why that setup is there now you've got to read it so so let me ask you guys this um Steve, you uh, you have a series, The Buried Goddess Saga, seven books? Six Is that books. right? Six. Six. Okay, excuse me. Six books, but it has a definitive end. Mm -hmm. um, Rick, your Drop Trooper series is like a, a series of trilogies? Is that safe Three, to uh, describe? Four, book, four, four books. Four books. Four books, arcs, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, just purely by accident, because I was going to make – the war end in three books, but then it took four. And then after that, <laughs> when we continue to say, well, it's four books. Josh, you're in the middle of writing a trilogy now. Um, I, I, uh, I interviewed Lee child uh, and, and his brother, Andrew, uh, a year or so ago. And we were talking about the character of Jack Reacher. Um, Reacher is in, uh, in danger all of the time. He could die. In, in any Jack Reacher book, uh, Reacher could die at any time. We know Jack Reacher is not going to die because Lee Child himself has retired and handed the franchise off to his brother, who is continuing to write it. Um, we know every year there's going to be a, a tentpole release of a new Jack Reacher book, and Reacher is going to continue you know, ad infinitum that Reacher just like, nothing. just like we know Tom Clancy's characters will continue. And Jack Ryan, I guess is going to be the new emperor of the world. I don't know how you can keep, you know, <laughs> right. Him to new levels. But. Yeah. Once you get to be the president, you can't go like, you know, hijacking cars or kicking over. Yeah. Right. Right. But so you can run, you can run down to the Harbor and watch your anti-missile system shoot down Chinese nukes. Right. <laughs> so my question is, um, how do you know that there's an end to what you're doing? Um, you know, with, with buried, uh, goddess saga, six books, it's done. Um, Jack Reacher will continue for the next million years. Uh, Dresden is another good example. That's a long running series, but uh, but Butcher has said there's a definitive end to this series. It's it's going somewhere. There will be an ultimate, um, you know, conclusion to this series. How do you how do you know what needs to come to an end, and what has the option of just continuing? I think that depends on what kind of series you're wanting to write. Like you mentioned uh, <clears throat> Jack Reacher and, and Tom Clancy, uh, you know, the, the gray man is a, is a good example the of this too, man. where he he's purposely leaving the gray man ageless so he can do multiple books and, and write until maybe they don't sell anymore or whatever. But uh, I don't know that he has a, I don't know that you could do a, 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 a grand sweeping ending to the, the gray man, because it's just not how those books are written right. um, with like the buried it's goddess the or expectation that was set to the readers from the beginning. 100%. And, and, and I think like with some stories, like with the buried goddess or, or anything else where you have, 
an ultimate ending that they have to get to. There's, there's no other way. Like they have to get to this ending because that's the whole point. Whereas in a gray man, there's not an ultimate ending. There's just like, how does he succeed over this particular problem? Um, and I think that really, again, it really just depends on what kind of series you're writing. I've got a fantasy trilogy that will have an ultimate ending because after that, there's not really any story to tell. Um, with Weaponized, I'm writing it so that it is going to be a fulfilling trilogy, but hopefully I can do other books, subsequent books in the series and kind of do it like a Mission Impossible or a Gray Man where we can just continue to go on these adventures with the characters because i i purposely did not want to have a grand sweeping conspiracy that we have to solve and then everything's hunky dory i didn't want to have that because i think that's kind of played out sometimes um but you know there are a lot of good series and trilogies and nine book series and you know whatever that have really good you know, Sanderson and his uh, Stormlight Archives, it's going to be 10 books. Of course, it's going right. to be like 15 years till we get to the end of that. But um, there's an ultimate ending to that. And then there's not going to be any more. Um, well, there's interestingly, I get emails all the time about Buried Goddess Saga. Hey, I just finished it. They go into some of the stuff at the end. They're like, can we expect more? And my response is, how? Right. How do you expect us to, I mean, I know, I know you guys have not read the ending, so you don't know, but like it, there's, there's no going forward here. It's done and it yeah. is purposely done, but that's a perfect example of people who just want to live in that world. They always say something like, I want to return to Pantigo, which is the name of our world. And I go, that's, that's great. But like, it won't be with these characters. Mm -hmm. Is there a place called Pantigo Bay? Pantigo is a small town in Arlington, Texas, um, that one day I was driving by and I saw Pantigo Bible Church. And I'm like, that's such a great name. That's the name of our, our world. <laughs> well, um, I love it. With the uh, Drop Trooper, for instance, I the, the world the world is pretty expansive and I have a lot of stuff already written in it because I've been writing in that universe since the late, like the early 1990s. Um, so there's a lot of space for those characters to explore and, and stuff for them Literally. to get into. So it's, it's just, uh, it's more of a case of, them, of, of finding something else that can happen rather than trying to continue a series of events that ended, you know, and try to make it go on. They, it, the characters just have to go do something else. The the challenge is making it realistic that that much could happen to the same people. Right. It's kind of like Longmire with uh, the sheriff who deals with the murder every episode in a state whose population is smaller than most yeah. big metropolitan areas. But well, Riggs right. is a great example of how you continue a story. Uh, he'll often text us, but the war's over. How do I do more? Or this is done. How do I do more? And and as the, the publisher, and maybe I'm revealing too much, but the answer is always, I don't know, but do it. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple of days later, we got this four book arc, and he's like, I think this will work. And I read it, and I go, Yeah, it'll work. It, people love the character. People love the world. Just just you know, give them. More I get a lot of I get lots of messages about other series, you know, wanting if there's a way to continue. But I mean, like for instance, that. Um, uh, Star Bounty series. Um, at the end of the fourth book, the main character, who's been a bounty hunter, uh, gets a job basically in law enforcement. So, you know, you can't continue the bounty hunter book because he's not a bounty hunter anymore. And I always tell people if I did go back, it's going to have to be him back in law enforcement, not, not being a bounty hunter. I could go back to the characters. But the setup of that series is done, you know. My answer, my answer is usually more less magical than yours. Um, if somebody asked me about a series that that maybe did middling or not as well as I needed it to, and they say, "How do we get more of those books?" I I, I say, "Go tell a hundred thousand of your friends to read yeah. this." One hundred percent. That's what I tell people about uh, the the Gates 
trilogy. Because I'm already great at this. You only remember getting more. Yeah, it's like I'm sorry, it just didn't that well enough for me for me to. I, write more books in this series i've got a couple of people that every time i talk about weaponized on uh like on my facebook or, or wherever i get private messages what about valor i want more valor books and i'm like hey, same same thing as steve said have a lot of your people go read the other books and and then we'll we'll talk about it because i would like to write more of that i think that that series that universe is set up in a way that i could do more but yeah, a lot of times it just comes down to profitability and is it worth your time to write in it? Which sucks because like, no, there's a lot of stuff going on right now that is making a lot of that redundant and stupid. And uh, the, 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 the people that want to really write really good stories where people feel fulfilled and engaged and want to read those. Um, it could be questionable um, whether or not those particular books are going to gain traction, which a lot of, with a lot of the things that are happening right now. So I agree. Um, next week, I think I would like to talk about um, publishing and the realities of the, the market as, as it is right now. And, and that, that might be a great time to talk about some of the, um, Issues that have come up in the last couple of days. Behavior. Yes. Yeah. What's yes. That? Yeah. No, he, he said nefarious behavior. Nefarious behavior. Yeah, that's that's a great way to to, to put that. Um, but if if you and, and this is not a question for today, but I, I it's something I've been thinking about. If you were getting into publishing today and had no idea. And I didn't, you just had a story you wanted to tell and you, you wrote a story. Um, what would you do with it? Would you, would you go the trad pub route? Would you indie pub? Would you find a, a hybrid uh, publisher? You know, that the, this is something that I'd kind of like to explore uh, next week. So if you guys want to think about that and, and maybe it's uh, time to have an, an honest discussion about where the publishing industry is right now what the realities of that and the, we might need longer than an hour next we'll, week then. We'll, and you're loud and we'll, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of leave it open but there's uh uh you know there, there's some there's some discussion uh points that have come up in the last couple of days and uh i didn't really want to talk about it today because i, I wanted to kind of get over the initial kind of uh you know the the anger responses uh because i, I have very <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm very opinionated about it, but I want to hold off until I can talk about it intelligently. Well, I have one uh, thing, or, one or thing. artificially intelligently, or artificially. <laughs> I have one quick thing to say about that. My answers yeah. are: um, if I gave honest answers, because you said let's have an honest discussion about this, I would get canceled in two minutes flat. So I don't know that there is a truly open, honest conversation about the publishing industry that can be had in a public forum. That's just my brutal answer. Um, we can try our best. We can dance around some things, but the reality is it's such Who's a volatile, cancel you, Steve? Uh, I mean, I guess you can't be canceled unless you want to be canceled, but but there's some answers that are that it that exist today that you're not allowed to speak. Um, just like we've heard, you know, Kanye made some statements and they were ridiculous statements, but like, uh, you can't make certain statements, even if they're in honest, in an honest, I don't know. You understand what I'm saying here? Well, I guess we all know who represents the half glass full, uh, the, the half, the glass, glass half, full. half empty. There we go. I think wow, there's some beautiful cool. things happening in the publishing industry. I really, really do. But I also think that there's some corporate games being played that in the sense of when Belloc said it's beautiful and then his face melted off. <laughs> right. uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll try to dance around some of the subject matter that um, is questionable, but at the same time, that's honest. And so I'll, I'll try to spend the week figuring out how to word some things Um in the most politically correct ways. Well, there's, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we definitely don't want to discourage people. From, no, not at all. 
That's why I want to think about it to be encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think there's a lot of things that you could talk about the publishing industry that don't really, if they don't really touch on what, what we're all thinking right now, there's a lot yeah. of things that, that we can touch on in a very honest way, in a very blunt way for people coming in to this sphere sphere. Now, um, I, I don't know whether they're going to be discouraged or not. I, I just want to be honest and, and talk about those things. Um, and I think we can talk about those things without any, any worry about anything else because uh, those things are factually true. And there's um, good alternatives. And they're waiting. One, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, good subject matter. Let's do that. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, I want to approach it from, from the perspective of someone has, has no knowledge of publishing whatsoever. For sure. They, yeah, they just have a story they want to tell, or maybe someone has, you know, had a uh, some sort of uh, life situation. They feel like they have a memoir they want to write. What what should their expectation be? Um, you know, just because you, Nobody you have a compelling it. story and you put it out there doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to be, you know, made into, you know, the movie of the week or, or whatever. Um but you know what, that's a great subject. What, what, of the week, what, it's what like, can uh, you honestly expect? Yeah. There. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's tackle that next week. Thank you all for joining us. This has been a very fast hour, and uh, maybe someone will actually bring an opinion next week. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Bye.